Well, we've just galloped through a thousand years of European Christian art and architecture in just six days, and now I'm going to commit an even greater educational crime and jet through 3,500 years of Chinese art in two days. Three, if you count our day on Chinese Buddhist art back in the earlier unit. I hope you can forgive me. I may not be able to forgive myself. This Jade Kong was our first Chinese work. It's a Neolithic work which means no written history, and there's a very lively debate among art historians about what the Kong and the face on it actually mean. Judging from its sample questions, the College Board has decided to come down on the side of the argument that the square shape represents the earth, just as round bi-discs represent the sky, and that the face has some kind of shamanistic associations. So none of these works shows up on the required list, but the method for making them does show up on the College Board's list of essential knowledge. Go figure. So what is the method? Remember these bronze works, the Hellenistic Boxer, the early medieval Hildesheim doors, and the 16th century Benin wall plank are all made from bronze using the lost wax method. Chinese bronzes, by contrast, were traditionally cast by the ancient Chinese in ceramic piece molds. So the artist makes a model and then takes a clay mold, cuts it into sections, and then the sections are reassembled after firing to provide a mold for the casting. So most of these works were excavated from from tombs. The Bronze Age Chinese believed that the king's right to rule was based on his good relationship with the spirits of his ancestors and with the great forces of nature, the sun and rain gods in particular, who controlled the outcome of the harvest. So to win their favors, the king made regular sacrifices of wine and cereals, which were placed in these elaborate bronze vessels and heated over the fire on the temple altar. I might add that human sacrifice was sometimes involved as well. Now, the Shang dynasty is the first historic Chinese dynasty. That is the first for which we have written records. I'm not including any art from the successor Zhao dynasty, but I do want to note that this is the dynasty that seems to have introduced the concept of the mandate of heaven basically to justify overthrowing the Shang rulers, whom the Zhao claimed, probably rightly, had become corrupt and self-indulgent. You watch the homework video and know all about the mandate of heaven, right? The Zhao dynasty gradually dissolved into several competing kingdoms who, as the name Warring States period suggests, spent a lot of time fighting each other. This relatively short period is actually extremely important to Chinese history and to art history, Not so much because of the art that it produced, but because the turmoil helped give rise to three very important philosophical schools that are represented in Chinese art, arguably up to this day. Since we have a huge amount of ground to cover and you have learned all about these philosophies in your homework, right? I'm going to move fast. Confucius was a minor government official who was deeply disturbed by the chaos that was overwhelming China. He developed a philosophy that focused on creating and preserving social order, mostly through right relationships. These relationships were hierarchical, with the most important being father-son, and the ruler became in essence father to the entire country. Another Chinese religious tradition that developed during this period was Taoism. It also focused on harmony, but in this case it was a harmony created by an equilibrium of opposites, the yin and the yang, shown by these familiar symbols. Taoism also focused on unity with nature and a way that put a person into harmony with his or her environment, very influential with Chinese landscape art. To talk about the third philosophy, legalism, I'm going to turn to China's first emperor and our first college board required work for this unit. China was reunited in 221 BCE under King Cheng, who later renamed himself Shi Huangdi, or First Emperor. He initially ruled the Qin Kingdom on the western edge of the Old Zhao Kingdom. Emperor Qin and his associates followed a harsh philosophy or school of law known as legalism, which had also grown out of the turmoil of the Warring States period. It was an extreme form of absolutism. It basically called for unquestioned devotion to the king or emperor. Eventually, this stern governing philosophy and a very powerful, well-led army broke the power of the regional feuding factions and united China. 
Basically, legalists thought Confucians were a bunch of softies and Taoists were a bunch of tree huggers. Off with their heads after we've slowly cut off all the other parts of their body. Uh, Qin famously ordered most existing books to be burned and buried more than 400 Confucian scholars alive just in case. But to give this first emperor his due credit, he was also an extraordinarily effective emperor. He unified China and expanded its borders significantly. He built the first version of the Great Wall. He established a uniform set of language characters, currency, and a system of weights and measures. He created efficient central and regional bureaucracies, and he built a powerful army manned by soldiers from all over China. Remember the Chinese belief that ancestors become spirits who could wreak good or evil for their descendants, depending on how diligently those descendants kept feeding the ancestors food and drink or otherwise propitiating the spirits. Chinese historians report that Emperor Shuang uh, Shi Wangdi was obsessed with his own immortality, but apparently, and for good reason, he was not especially confident the future generations were going to take good care of him. He set out to solve this problem the way he'd solve all of the other problems, with a powerful army loyal to the emperor. The discovery of Emperor Qin's terracotta army is one of the most amazing stories in the history of archaeology, and I don't have time to tell it now, alas. Amazingly, archaeologists haven't even opened his main tomb. Not only can the age and mood of the soldiers be seen from their facial expressions, but their faces also represent soldiers from different parts of China. Interestingly, the head, arms, legs, and torso were created separately and then assembled. This was a kind of uh, production line manufacture. The terracotta figures are life-sized. They vary in height, uniform, and hairstyle in accordance with rank. Most originally held real weapons, such as spears, swords, or crossbows. And in fact, these weapons have become a hugely important source of information for military historians. The figures were also heavily painted with bright pigments, which have worn off. We've seen that before with Greek statues, right? Qin Shi Huangdi decreed a mass production approach to creating his army. Artisans, who may have been makers of drainage pipe before they got put to work on the army, uh, turned out figures almost like cars on an assembly line. Clay, unlike bronze, lends itself to quick and cheap fabrication. So workers built bodies, then they customized them with heads, hats, shoes, mustaches, ears, and so on, made in small molds. Some of the figures appear so strikingly individual that they seem that they're modeled on real people, but that's unlikely. The British Museum curator of an exhibit on these soldiers thinks they may have been aggregate portraits. The ceramicists could have been told that they needed to represent different types of people, different kinds of face and body structures, who came from different regions of China. By the way, recent digs have revealed that in addition to clay soldiers, uh, Shi Wangdi's underground realm included terracotta officials and even troops of acrobats, slightly smaller than the soldiers, but created with the same methods. You see one here. He also had a lot of company in his tomb. Any concubine who had not borne him a son had the dubious honor of being strangled and buried with the emperor. And the workmen who built the tomb were also closed in as soon as it was completed and left to die. Altogether, a charming fellow. The brutal but effective Qin Dynasty was succeeded by the Han Dynasty, which ruled China for a period roughly comparable to that of the Roman Empire. Now, this was one. This was China's golden age, or one of its golden ages, a time of economic prosperity, scientific advance, and at least at first, political unity and pretty good governance. It was also an era of great art. Han work fills art museums all over the world. I've included a few examples here, none of which is a required work. Instead, we're going to examine just one Han Dynasty work, but it's an artifact that really captures the world of the Han Dynasty remarkably well. Before I get to Lady Di's funeral banner, let me talk a little bit about what historians call the Han Synthesis. Basically, Han rulers combined the three philosophies I talked about earlier, Confucianism, Taoism and legalism. The Han rulers revered books and learning. They were not burning books or burying scholars alive. But the Han rulers did adopt the Qin belief in an absolute central government, and they spent most of their period in power trying to regain the same level of centrality and control that Qin and the legalists had so ruthlessly imposed on China. 
Taoism contributed to the Han belief that the universe is run by a single principle, the Tao or great ultimate, but that that principle is divided into two opposite principles, the yin and the yang. Yang is the force of creation. Yin is the force of completion, but also of degeneration. Yang is male. Yin is female. From Confucianism, Han thinkers and emperors adopted the notion of hierarchy, with the emperor very much on top. But note that the responsibilities were mutual, uh, and especially that the emperor was responsible for creating economic conditions that promoted prosperity and for ruling by example, basically as a strict but benevolent father. An emperor who followed these principles and maintained a balance between them would, the theory went, earn the mandate of heaven and enjoy a long and prosperous reign. So we just looked at one of China's big archaeological finds from the last century. The tombs at Mawangdui in Hunan province were another one of these finds. The three coffins you see on the right held a Chinese nobleman, his wife, and probably their son. The Lady of Dai was buried with a large collection of luxury goods intended to sustain her in the afterlife. By the way, her body was so well preserved, the doctors were able to perform an autopsy and discover she died of a heart attack, probably caused by a diet too rich in sugar and fat. The painted silk banner was draped over her coffin. Earlier, it had probably been carried in front of her funeral procession to represent her name in the afterlife, although some art historians think it may have been intended to bring her back to life. Immortality was serious business in China, as we just saw. Makes me think about Egypt. A more likely theory is that the banner was intended to attract the spirit of the deceased to its tomb, where it could be properly started on its afterlife journey instead of remaining on earth to bother the living. Troublesome ancestors were also serious business in China. The banner describes Lady Di's journey to heaven. It's decorated with grave goods, spirits, legends, and symbols of immortality. Um, and associated with the Queen Mother of the West. I won't try to pronounce the Chinese names because I will just mess them up. The banner's design is divided vertically into yin on the left and yang on the right, mixture in the center and yang on the right. And it's divided horizontally into the three realms, heaven, earth, and the underworld. So let's start with the upper or heavenly realm. On the left side, or the yin or female side, we see a toad above and a rabbit next to a crescent moon. According to legend, a woman named Chang Yi selfishly gulped down an elixir of immortality that her husband had won from the Queen of the West, taking it all for herself. She did gain immortality, but she began to float up toward the moon and was transformed into a toad. Next to the moon, we see the rabbit pounding herbs into a mortar to make that elixir of immortality. On the right side, remember that's the yang or masculine side, we see a sun with a raven. According to legend, ten suns lived in a tree. Each morning, one of the suns took a turn shining on the sky, leaving the others resting in the tree. One day, bored with their orderly life, they all rushed up into the sky at once, ran around wildly. The legendary archer Hu Yi became so angry uh, at this, that he, uh, at the sign that the dead and dying burned people on the earth, that he shot nine of the ten sons. He had to be reminded to leave one sun in the sky. The central figure is probably Nuwa, a goddess who had the body of a snake and could change shape 70 times a day. She modeled the first people from mud and taught them how to have children. On either side of her are cranes, which are symbols of longevity. Below them are heavenly dragons. The dragons shown here are those that draw the moon and the sun across the sky, sort of like Apollo and his chariot. Now, experts argue over these interpretations, and I don't know enough to take sides. But let me ask more generally, what do these images suggest about Chinese beliefs? It seems pretty clear that this design reflects at least some belief in an ordered heavenly realm, a natural division between female and male roles, a strong preference for everybody following the rules to maintain order. The central part of the banner shows Lady Di in her earthly roles. She leans on a cane while two persons crouch or kneel in front of her and three women, presumably female attendants, stand behind her. 
Uh, here we see her family offering sacrifices and prayers for the safe descent of Lady Di's soul to heaven. Notice that the ritual vessels for offering food and drink to the ancestors look a lot like the bronzes we saw at the beginning of this lecture. So Khan Academy didn't include an image from the underworld for some reason, but here we see it, a powerful male figure supporting the lower platform, bracing his feet against the back of two intertwined fish who seem to be getting it on, more yin and yang. In fact, this figure may be a water deity who generates yin and yang and therefore ensures that seasons progress, crops grow, and more babies are born. Does this remind you of imagery we saw back in our in unit on Hindu, Buddhist, and Islamic art? Remember the statues in the Hindu temple? Back to the banner. Note that two dragons run along the edge of the lower section, helping to unify the space. Their bodies pass through the hole of a bi disc, which traditionally represented the sky or heavenly realms, just as the square Kong represents the earth. So what do dragons signify in Chinese tradition? First, in Chinese tradition, unlike, say, Christian tradition, such as St. George slaying the dragon, dragons are sort of good guys. They bring masculine energy, or yang, to the universe. They bring rain, but they also bring floods and earthquakes. In other words, they represent power. And the Han emperors, eager to win and keep power, adopted the dragon as their symbol. So here we have belief in an afterlife, depiction of family piety and order, the contrast of yin and yang, a shout out to the emperor, the Han synthesis immortalized on a single piece of silk. The Han dynasty also saw a major expansion in China's interaction with people outside its borders. The famous Silk Road opened under Han rule. It skirted, and indeed it was sheltered by the Great Wall. It connected China, ultimately through middlemen in Central Asia, to Constantinople and Rome. The Silk Road also encouraged travel, and Chinese society became increasingly cosmopolitan. Heavy tax burdens from this centralized bureaucracy, concentration of land in the hands of a few wealthy aristocrats, and disunity at court brought down the Han Dynasty. For the next 300 years, China had another period of being ruled by warring states. Eventually, in 618, the Tang Dynasty would succeed in reuniting China and would rule until 908. We've actually already talked about the Sui and Tang dynasties. What big development from this period shows up in our course? These were the years when Buddhism came to China. A Mahayana Buddhism, you may recall, that emphasized communal salvation, a hierarchical order including multiple Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and communion with nature, all themes that resonated with the Chinese. The Sui and Tang leaders also used Buddhism to bolster their political power. Remember China's one empress, Wu Zetan? She was the great patron of this complex, which was the Longman Caves. I'm going to stop here and finish up my whirlwind tour of Chinese art in my next lecture. Be forewarned, questions about Buddhist and Hindu art from the earlier unit will reappear on this unit test. You'll have a chance to review the earlier unit test and it will make a few fewer topics that you need to worry about for your semester final.